relation. Welcome. On I Spy tonight, more incredible real life stories caught on video and surveillance camera. Fox hunting, the pro and the anti hunt campaigners do battle. You don't think so. How CCTV is helping police the streets of inner city London. And the mystery of the jeweler found unconscious in her shop. My mother prompted me watch the videotape, watch the videotape. But first, video evidence is often vital to the police. It's more unusual, however, for the camera itself to be used as bait. But that's exactly what happened when two Boston detectives devised a distinctly American line in catching criminals. Boston, on the east coast of the United States. The city once boasted a thriving shipbuilding industry, but most of its docks are now closed, making them the perfect place for film sets. Meet detectives Joe Fiandaka and Don Goslin, two Boston cops with an ingenious line in crime fighting. Criminals are used to all different sorts of approaches to capture them. And we have to stay one step ahead of them. Don and Joe needed to round up more than 100 petty criminals with outstanding warrants. But rather than arrest them individually, they devised an elaborate sting to trap them all in one go. They set up a fake film company and mailed letters to the wanted men and women, offering jobs as extras in a new Robert De Niro movie. Each was promised a generous fee of $220. We appealed to ego and we appealed to greed. And when you appeal to two base drives like that, uh, one of them is going to work and probably both of them are going to work. The location, a dry dock in the heart of Boston. A police cameraman records as Sergeant Goslin gives a final briefing to his team. Anything, anything on you that says police officer okay. except a handgun okay. and cuffs, ditch it, get rid of it. Any way that you can give them as little information as possible. Uh, you know, is, is Robert De Niro there? Gee, I, I think so. You know, he's the director. Is Andy Garcia there? I'm not sure. We're just starting the shoot today. We got them this far. They're hooked. You know, they're, they're hooked. The unsuspecting extras arrive in a courtesy bus. Good, good. good morning. Welcome to Crown Casting. Has anybody done any acting before? TV, what look kind? Excellent, excellent. Listen, if you could, when you get off the bus, would you line up by height? Right here. The folks that showed up all expected to be in a movie. So the camera, uh, when they got off that bus, was uh, nothing unusual for them to see. I think you're going to like this. Then, the sting. Joe reveals the real reason for the audition. Listen, you've all been invited here for one particular reason. That's because you've got outstanding warrants on you. OK? There you go. OK? They're all under arrest. You to take your hands and put your hands behind you. Keep your hands out of your pocket. Hands out of your pocket, folks, all right? They were totally in shock. They, they couldn't believe it the first couple of seconds. They just stood there looking around trying to figure out, is this real? Is this part of the, uh, the movie we're going to be involved in? And then when they started speaking among themselves, they all realized everybody had warrants. People had brought cameras, and they wanted to take pictures of the stars. And even after this woman is in handcuffs and she's about to be led away to jail, she said, well, where's De Niro? I, I really wanted to see him. We promised that we would make them famous. And we delivered on that promise, but not in the way that they expected. There are now over a million surveillance cameras in Britain, and their impact has been dramatic. In tonight's Street Watch, we see how one of London's toughest inner city areas has been transformed thanks to CCTV. Oh. 
This is Lewisham. It was once burdened with one of the highest crime rates in London, but that was before cameras were installed. We've seen a dramatic reduction in the amount of crime and particular street crime in the areas covered. We've seen falls of 80% and more in some areas. The camera operators can spot crimes as they're about to be committed and quickly tip off police officers. Here, suspicions are aroused by a group of young men gathered on a street corner. It's three o'clock in the morning. One of them approaches two men at a bus stop and claims his car has broken down in a side road. The men agree to help start it and go with him, but they're followed by the rest of the gang. It's a trap. Out of sight of the cameras, they're mugged. As the attackers walk off, they divide the spoils, but what they don't realize is they're being watched and that the police are on their way. The five men were all jailed after being found guilty of robbery. This man appears to be innocently returning to his parked van, but when he tries the door handle and wanders off, the operators decide to keep an eye on him. Round the corner, he tries another vehicle. This one's unlocked. He climbs into the back and searches inside. Moments later, he's out, but once again, the police have already been tipped off. This time, however, the arrest is not so simple. He was later arrested and jailed for three months. The drop in crime is encouraging new businesses to open, improving the whole area. The CCTV system in the town centres has been absolutely critical to that achievement. But not everything caught on camera is as serious as it first appears. These two sparked a major alert when they were seen pointing what looks like a handgun at passing cars. Armed police cordon off the area as the pair disappear into a nearby house. A police team wearing body armour creep up to the front door of the property. But they discover that the firearm is an air pistol and the gunmen, two teenagers. They were both cautioned. This man doesn't appear to have noticed that he's being filmed. He smashes a billboard and then has a go at a phone box. He's surprised when police arrive, so they show him the camera. It transpires that he thought it was a bird box. Now, how CCTV solved a mystery. In November 1997, Joan Keeley was visited in her Plymouth jewellery shop by friend Alan Edwards. I called into the shop and found Joan wandering around the shop in a bit of a daze. She had a nasty wound to the left-hand side of her head. I asked her actually what had happened and she said she thought she'd fallen. Well, it was then that, we, that I actually called the ambulance. I was really quite concerned about her. She seemed to be going in and out of consciousness. When I reached the hospital and got to her bedside, she was really quite unrecognisable um, because of her head and facial injuries. It was suspected that Joan had suffered a brain hemorrhage, but five days later, she still couldn't remember what had happened. My mother prompted me, um, although it was very difficult for her to speak. She did say to me, watch the videotape, watch the videotape. After two hours watching CCTV footage from his mother's shop, Declan came across this scene. When the um, assailant came in, I didn't really take very much notice, first of all. He walked in, looked around, looked like a, you know, a bona fide customer, as it were. I was absolutely horrified by the speed and uh, ferocity of the attack. He attracts her attention uh, by placing a taped up ring box on the counter and then when her head is in the right position he hits her with what would appear to be a metal cosh. He then goes behind the counter, he removes uh, 1800 pounds worth of jewellery. For me by far the worst part of watching the videotape was the heart-rending scene after he'd left the shop and watching my mother struggle to come around and regain consciousness. The police mounted a massive media campaign to find the attacker. I think anyone seeing this who knows this character is going to be able to put a name to him. The robber was identified as Glenn Evans from Stoke-on-Trent. Evans was arrested but denied any involvement. We were convinced that Glenn Evans was our man, but we were also aware that he might escape conviction through lack of evidence. 
Police interviewed Evans's girlfriend, but she at first refused to admit he could be responsible. The turning point came when they showed her the video. And she was shocked by what she saw. She told us that they had visited a jewellery shop in Stoke-on-Trent where Glenn had sold a quantity of jewellery. Police went to the shop and recovered the stolen jewellery. The girlfriend later retracted her statement, but by now they had all the evidence they needed. Evans was jailed for 10 years. Joan Keeley still suffers hearing and memory loss. Had the video not recorded the, the events of that day, I think even today we'd be none the wiser. We would still be, uh, we would still think it was a, an accident. It's time to take a break now, but when we return in part two... The miraculous escape of these school children when a bus runs out of control. The fox hunt clashes caught on camera. Hey, back off, back off! You stupid little man the extraterrestrial that prowls the streets of Bournemouth. Welcome back. Wherever there's crime, there are usually cameras nearby in almost every town and city. But one of Britain's most sophisticated surveillance systems is found in a county normally associated with holidays, Devon. The English Riviera takes in 22 miles of coastline and the towns of Torquay, Brixham and Paynton. It's winter now and all is quiet, but in the summer the population doubles with the influx of holidaymakers. The cameras help ensure they feel safe while they're here. We started off with a car park system which cut out 95% of the crime in, in car parks in the sound centre. We've expanded it now until it's one of the biggest systems in Europe. The council has some of the most technologically advanced equipment available. The cameras are so powerful that the operators are able to read a newspaper over someone's shoulder from a distance of 100 yards. So when a man decides to settle an argument with a claw hammer, they're quick to spot him. You see him come into view, and quite distinctly in his left hand, you can see the hammer. Now, I don't really need to elaborate on the possible consequences of that young man using that weapon. It could be quite devastating. So what we've got to do is disarm him very quickly. So the police respond quickly to the incident and disarm him and take him into custody. The man was put on probation for six months. With around 900 pubs and clubs in the borough, cameras are vital in helping police control public order. Here, even the girls join in as two rival groups fight it out in Torquay. At one stage, almost a dozen people are involved in the brawl. They don't realize they're right underneath a camera and the police are about to arrive. I certainly remember a time when public order incidents were much more common, much more large scale than the ones that we have now. The cameras have contributed in no small way to that success. Brixham Harbour poses some unusual problems for the police. This man was spotted breaking into boats. When one owner tries to detain him, he jumps into the sea. But there's no escape from the camera. One of the boat owners turns a searchlight to help the operator keep the man in his sights. As police arrive, he again makes for the water. But he's trapped. He was later found guilty of theft. It's half past 11 at night when the control room's suspicions are aroused by this man. He hears a car coming and behaves nonchalantly. It passes and all becomes clear. Inside the shop, he steals a charity box containing a few coins. He's away in seconds, but is arrested off camera and later sentenced to 12 months probation. In the CCTV control room, PC Doug Criven coordinates the team and is in constant touch with officers on the ground. The cameras are tracking two men suspected of using stolen credit cards. Vehicle in Union Street, they're on your right, on your right, over. Yeah, the one in the cap has got the cards over. 
One of the men was later charged with failing to appear in court. The credit card theft is still being investigated. There was always the fear that, that the public might view this as Big Brother watching them, but in fact there's been overwhelming support from the public. Much of what's filmed is just high spirits. At first, this looks like a fight. In fact, it's two friends fooling around. And this young man is just looking for someone to share his ice cream. Now it's time for the Ice Buy Appeal. At about 3 p.m. on the 4th of August, 1998, two young men and a woman enter this off-license in Wirral, Merseyside. While two of them appear to distract the shop assistant, a third leans over the counter and opens the till. He keeps glancing to make sure the assistant doesn't spot him and steals £195. If you can help identify these individuals, call Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Calls are free and you don't have to give your name. Knox, Indiana. Like many other American towns, the school buses here are fitted with onboard cameras. On one Monday afternoon, they recorded an incredible event where a boy's quick thinking saved the lives of 25 children. Bus number 13's journey began as normal, but before long, the young passengers on board noticed there was something wrong. We'd only made like two stops. We get past one stop, and then we're supposed to turn right onto, onto my street. Well, bus driver doesn't turn. This footage was caught by the onboard camera. A lot of the younger children are enjoying the ride, oblivious to any danger. But as the bus picks up speed and misses another turning, John, the oldest pupil on board, decides to investigate. He goes up to talk to the driver, but finds him slumped across the wheel. Uh, I ask him if he's lost or if he's okay. He's like, and he just does. He doesn't respond. He's just like kind of staring straight ahead. As the road bore right, the speeding bus plowed onto a rough track, heading straight for an eight-foot irrigation ditch. Here's the front of the bus. The bridge. The bridge is over here. The bus was going like this across the bridge, with the right-hand tires hanging off. On the other side, there's a cement block. The front tire hits that, sends the front of the bus into the air. John acts quickly, drags the driver's foot off the accelerator and pulls on the brake. The bus comes to a halt and John calls for help on the CB. I heard a teenage voice come over one of the radios saying that the bus driver had an apparent seizure and they needed assistance. None of the children was seriously hurt. The bus driver later made a full recovery in hospital. John's actions that day were remarkable in that uh, they were quick, decisive, and correct. Many adults in a similar situation may not have been able to keep their head about them as John did. Yeah, I guess you could call me a hero if you, if you want, but to me, yeah, it's, I just did what I thought any other person would do. Fox hunting is an increasingly contentious issue, and in the battle for public sympathy, both the pro and anti blood sports camps have discovered their best weapon is the video camera. Every weekend across the country, 150 hunts gather for their traditional sport. While opponents do everything they can to disrupt them. The confrontations are often angry and sometimes violent. I will take the horn, I will give it to the police officer. Oh, you Increasingly, video cameras are being used to capture irrefutable evidence of violence. On a large hunt, there can be as many as five cameras rolling, and often the cameraman becomes a target. This is Simon Wilde, a hunt saboteur. Another Saturday morning, and he and his friends are in the English countryside, aiming to disrupt the day's events. For about seven or eight years, I was doing a lot of photography, and in fact, I... Um, got about two hunts people convicted through my photographs 
And then as video started to become smaller and cheaper in the early 90s, I moved on to, the, to using video. Simon has filmed incidents like this at the Portman Hunt in Dorset. Uh, one person who I, I know from another hunt raced down with an axe handle halfway down, then looked around and saw me with my camera. And at that point, another guy uh, came down the hill a few seconds later, hadn't seen the camera, and he went racing into one of the hunt sabs and just began setting about him extremely viciously. Camera! The saboteur suffered cuts and bruises, but the case was dropped due to lack of evidence. However, this video led to the first ever jail sentence for hunt supporters. Oh, yeah. oh. Hunt saboteur Tony Humphreys is pushed into the path of the quad bike by a hunt follower. His attacker and the driver were jailed for two months. So it's, it's all right, don't worry. My bat, my bat. Hunt supporters are now beginning to recognize the power of video. In recent years, they've turned the cameras on the saboteurs. Are you filming? Are you filming? Filming us. I think they started using cameras ahead of us. Yes, they did. And we really, and that's really why we started, doing started it, to use it? the cameras to show that what they were saying wasn't actually quite true. We were showing our side of things using a video camera. This was filmed two years ago in Chiddingfold, Surrey. The two women are trying to video saboteurs who've hidden a foxhound in their van. I don't think so. It was quite alarming because we ran forward and um, didn't realise that there was nobody with us until we were being hit, mm. <laughs> which seems to go on for quite a long time. We might get an awful lot of verbal abuse that the man in the street who's not used to it, might, or woman in the street, might actually get quite upset about, but we've had it for so long now. I mean, a decade of abuse and you just don't notice it anymore. The cameras are often the best source of protection. If you haven't got it, um, I'm sure that they look and think there are no cameras around, we can do what we like. The hunt sabs just won't go into the woods unless there's someone covering their backs with a video. But sometimes the camera actually provokes a reaction. Silly little man, aren't you? You stupid little man. You moronic little idiot. Just clear Staff here see some unusual things through the surveillance cameras, but nothing quite as strange as a sight that met the eyes of operators one night in Bournemouth. A seven and a half foot alien is prowling the streets. The police are notified and approach with caution. But this particular visitor has only come from a nearby flat. He's actually a student who wants to protest that CCTV cameras can see into his friend's bedroom. And that's all from I Spy for this week. Good night. Next night, we take a backseat ride in a police car patrolling Britain's busiest stretch of motorway.